This is the Voice of Russia. The London Bureau of the Voice of Russia is now live on digital radio and online. With news, comment and debate on weekdays between 4 and 7 p.m. Hello, this is Alice Lanyardo reporting for The Voice of Russia in London. The Boy from Baby House 10 is a book about a little boy in Russia who escaped from the nightmare of his life in an orphanage with the help of a British journalist. The little boy was called Vanya. Vanya was eventually adopted by a woman in America where he lives today. The journalist was Alan Philps of the Daily Telegraph who together with his wife Sarah, a teacher, decided to help Vanya to escape. After Vanya was successfully adopted, Alan wrote The Boy from Baby House 10, which tells Vanya's heartbreaking story. Alan and Sarah Phelps are here in the studio to talk about their long journey with Vanya from when they first met him in Russia to how they brought his story to the wider world. Sarah, how did it all begin? Well, we went to Russia because of Alan's work, wasn't it, Alan? Yep, I was the uh, Moscow correspondent for the Daily Telegraph uh, in the 1990s. I was very busy with politics, uh, and there was a war in Chechnya, a very busy time, and um, Sarah was doing something else. Um, well, you could say that I arrived in Russia. I did speak Russian and had taught Russian, but I didn't actually have any idea of the work I could do. I would have liked to have worked in Alan's office, but he, he preferred not to have me in the office. <laughs> so I had to look elsewhere, and quite by chance, I went to a meeting of the International Women's Club probably not somewhere I would normally have gone. Um, I was dragged along by a friend, and I met people who were visiting orphanages. Uh, they needed Russian speakers. They didn't have any. So I think the next day I was taken as an interpreter to my first baby house, which is an orphanage for the under fours. And what was that like? Oh, it, very difficult to describe. Very strange world, a very silent world. I remember visiting the, the... This was baby house number 10, where I ended up spending a lot of time. The baby house was in quite central Moscow, not far from a very busy shopping street. But most people walking past would not have known it was there. It was behind a high wall and a high gate. When you went through the gate, um, very dilapidated play area, shabby little wooden huts, and not a child in sight. Going into the baby house again, uh, silence. I eventually found out the reason there's silence is because the children were kept behind very thick, very thick doors, padded doors. So as a visitor, you don't actually hear children's voices when you enter these places. And the children can't move about the baby house freely. They're kept in rooms which are called grupa, groups. When you go into these places, unusually for a, a, a children's place of residence there's no sound of any there's no sound of any child and is that typical among russian orphanages i would say yes yes even for children's homes internats for older children yes the children are very much kept behind closed doors in groups and wouldn't mix with children from other groups prime minister vladimir putin recently said that he thought foreign adoption should stop and that children's homes should be improved Alan, how do you view Putin's statement? In fact, I think as long ago as 1997, wasn't it? I think uh, Putin ordered the federal authorities to uh, find ways of keeping children out of state institutions. As far as we can see, not all that much has changed because there are still about 18,000 children in these baby houses. That's for, for the, the under fours. For the nought to fours. And that's about the same number. Um, as uh, when Vanya, the hero of, uh, of our book, uh, was in Baby House number 10 back in the 1990s. So not all that much has changed. So there is a recognition amongst some people at the top that the, the system is harmful and something has got to be done. Um, but uh, it's a very long way from someone in the Kremlin or in the Prime Minister's office saying this and uh, the system actually changing because there are a lot of people who have an interest in keeping the system as it is. What has changed is the expertise in Russia itself. They're wonderful psychologists, neurologists, 
um, just uh, amateurs who have studied now the harm that is done to a small child or a child of any age in an institution. Um, there's, there are people in St. Petersburg, for example, who've done a study and they say that every part of a child's development, particularly the brain, doesn't develop if a baby is placed in an institution, largely because of the absence of a mother figure. It doesn't have to be the child's mother, but a child, in order to develop properly emotionally, um, intellectually, and even to grow properly, needs someone special in his life, someone who thinks he is the centre of her universe. So it doesn't have to be a mother, it could be a foster mother. And this is now acknowledged outside the state orphanage system. Huge expertise now. That is the difference between now and the 90s. But unfortunately, it hasn't penetrated the thinking of those who are running state institutions. It's as, as if they don't want to hear this. Yeah, uh, one of the things which uh, one recent piece of research uh, has found out that a baby who is in a baby home from naught to, uh, to the fourth birthday could be looked after by as many as 100 different people because some of these are very big institutions, could could have uh, more than 100, maybe 100, 150 children. And they're moved from their groups. And if, they're, if they start to attach to one of the carers, they are deliberately moved. There is a policy of no attachment between children and carers. So as Alan says, they're moved about no stability, and apparently that's very detrimental to a child's emotional well-being. Yes, one of these Petersburg experts, a um, neurologist, says that uh, the harm done to children in a baby home is a bit like a disease. It's like uh, diphtheria or something like that. It can be cured by taking them out of the baby home and giving them some kind of stable family family life. Interestingly, just this year, UNESCO began a campaign called, I think it's Every Child Deserves a, Deserves a Family. That's right, yeah. Where Anthony Lake, the executive director, says... If children are going to be held in institutions, it should only be for a very short time and only for, for emergencies until something better is found. The idea of a child spending his or her whole life up to the age of 18 in state care has to change. After you visited uh, this first home, Sarah, how did your work develop and bring you towards meeting Vanya and writing the book. Did you start doing some kind of social work in Russian children's homes? Or? Well, as I say, I was taken in as an interpreter and they had, I think, one more interpreter in this charity group. So there was only two of us. So I ended up spending the first two, three years of our posting in Russia, spending you know most of my week inside these institutions. So I became a sort of expert on how they were run. And it, it was a very depressing experience because I, I'm a teacher. I'm not a physiotherapist or occupational therapist or a medical person. But just, you know, having been brought up in, in England, you have a pretty, you have a sort of a, a good general knowledge of how children should be treated and what's harmful to them. And also you can tell if a child looks at you in an intelligent way and wants to communicate. So my first very strong feeling was, why am I seeing something? And the Russian carers running these homes seem to be seeing a different picture. So I would go into a room of what they call the Chizolia, the Balnia, they would refer to as very seriously handicapped with no, no brain function. And I'd see a little boy, well, like Vanya, who just needed physical therapy or maybe someone to talk to. And some, a lot of these children could talk. And I'd say, well, but this child just needs a bit of help. Oh, no, no, no. He's not really communicating. It's just a reaction. Oh, no, no. And they'd use the same, these stock phrases. One in Russian was, Parajenia centralny nervni systemy. I used to hear this daily, a sort of defect of the central nervous system. And it was sort of like a coverall for all children. And then sometimes you'd meet a blind child in with the seriously disabled children and you think, well, all he is is blind. So it was the attitude of the carers that these were somehow not humans. I was very puzzled for a long time about their attitude. And um, so it was, I suppose it was a learning process, a learning process, whereas I was trying to work out w why they felt like this. And so I started taking, the next thing I did was taking any Western expert I could find, and the Russian foreign community was growing at that time, into the baby houses with me and trying to get them to explain. And they were as shocked as I was. I remember one woman from Oxford said the children in the heavily, very disabled room weren't, by English standards, weren't disabled at all or barely. The children she worked with back in Oxford had far less potential. And yet she did a full day's schoolwork with them. 
So I suppose that was the first thing I did. And then the next thing was to find Russians who felt as I did. And um, it was quite by chance my sister-in-law visited and, we, and she had an article from the Times Educational Supplement about a place called the Centre of Curative Pedagogics. And I'll never forget my first visit to the Centre of Curative Pedagogics, which was, say, three years after I'd been visiting these dreadful places. And it was like, I couldn't believe I was in Moscow, in the same country. These amazing Russians working with severely dis autistic children, all who lived at home with their parents, and doing the most wonderful therapy with them, treating them like human beings, eating lunch with them rather than just feeding them like animals. And this amazing place, which got no state support, no support at all and doing this wonderful wonderful work with very little pay and I suddenly thought my gosh our charity groups got to support these people yeah okay. yeah well, yeah okay. which is continuing yeah we realized that the state in, the state system was a system that basically had to go away and that what we had to do was support alternatives and that's even better isn't it because it's homegrown you're not just absolutely importing. absolutely yeah Yes, and I mean, it, it's in the, that was 1996, 95, 96, and in the, the interview, in the time period that's elapsed since then, these people have developed expertise and uh, work with children. They are as knowledgeable as anywhere in Britain, Canada, or Scandinavia. But the, the sad thing is, they're still not supported by the Russian state. So they're, that's something the state could do? Absolutely, give them the support, give them the money and the buildings and not the state institutions which, where attitudes have remained the same. They have remained the same. Now, how did you get to meet Vanya and write your book? I know <laughs> this is a lot to talk about in a short <laughs> space of time. Well, I think um, Sarah met Vanya on her first visit to Baby House 10. Uh, she was given a tour of the baby house mm -hmm. and she noticed that she wasn't being shown a door which said group two on it so she said can I go there and they said oh I don't think so blah, blah, blah. I said come on come on so she sort of forced her way and she had some toys and uh, this was for the um, for the incurables the very yeah. seriously disabled and it was completely silent completely silent room she looked around and saw all these all these children that seemed to have nothing to play with being sort of lying or, or moaning slightly and just as she was about to go this little voice piped up and said uh, do come back do come back do come, come back, back and see me again and I hadn't seen this child we we're sitting sort of behind the door at a little table with another boy so I ignored the carer who was trying to get me out of the room as quickly as possible because she did obviously feel uncomfortable she obviously did know that what those children were not being treated as they should be treated um, she was trying to get me out of the room, but Vanya wouldn't let her. So I knelt down and um, started talking to him, spoke beautiful Russian, and had a little, a little friend he introduced me to. I had a car, so I gave it to Vanya, and he, the, his first reaction was, have you got another one for Andre? Which I found quite astonishing, because those children, they're all in their private misery. If you do give them anything like a sweet or a hug, they only think of themselves, but this child was thinking of his friend. So they sort of played with their little cars, and then he looked me in the eye and he said, "What's your name?" And I said, "Sarah." Not in I didn't say Sarah, which is the Russian. I just said Sarah, and he repeated it perfectly, and said, "Sarah, I want you to come again, and see me." So he sort of made sure that I would return, and that was the beginning of our friendship. Because of course I had to return after that. And then over a number of years, you developed your relationship with him. Well, what happened was on one visit he suddenly disappeared, and. Um, Sarah said, said to the care, where's he gone? She said, oh, I don't know. And as Sarah, Sarah was leaving, the head of the... The head of, head of the baby house, she was rather, she was a very, sh very shy. As I was leaving, she, she grabbed me and said, I want to ask you something. And uh, she took me into her study and she said, uh, Vanya's gone to an internet. And I didn't know about internets at that time. And I said, well, what's that? And she said, well, that's where they send the children who are seriously disabled. And I, I said, but he's not seriously disabled. And we had this discussion. And she said he was very upset when, when my colleague took him there. Um, it's, it's not a nice place. And I saw by the door there was a, a, a pile of what looked like rags. In fact, they were clothes which the, the baby house staff had, had collected to take to Vanya's internet. And she said, I want you to go and visit him. And she said, I want you to bring him back to baby house 10, which is just the most astonishing thing, a foreigner. She's obviously thought that, I suppose it was the 90s, wasn't it, Alan, when foreigners, you know, had some magical power or thing. Said, you, you bring him back. It took me a while to actually do anything. And it was actually Vanya himself who forced me to do it because uh, we knew this one of the wonderful campaigners for children 
with disabilities there was a concert pianist Sergei Kalaskov he's also in the book very colorful character has a daughter with down syndrome he was going into these internats meeting children and trying to help them and he met Vanya and Vanya said do you know Sarah and luckily he did know me and Vanya said tell her to come and see me so in the end Alan you did go and see Vanya well Sarah said to me <clears throat> you have to write about this yeah I said no one cares. We know all about this from Romania because uh, these, the, uh, a similar system existed in uh, all my, uh, Eastern European countries and there was lots of publicity about uh, or, uh, orphanages, uh, the terrible situation in Romania back in 1989. I said, there's an old story, no one cares. She so said, we had no, big no. Arguments. She said, she said <laughs> Vanya especially, you have to do it. And, and I uh, said, this is uh, Russia, not Romania. Come on, you've got to write, you're in Russia. <laughs> well, and I said, well, as far as the readers of my newspaper concerned, Russia, Romania, not all that much difference. Anyway, so we had a bit of an argument about it. Eventually. Lots of arguments, yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> I went with uh, someone who, a uh, young woman, a young Russian woman who knew him. Vika. Uh, Vika. And she, she brought him out of the, the sort of the ward he was in, and uh, he seemed half dead. And I thought to myself, well, why, why is everyone making this fuss about this child who seems to be more dead than alive? He couldn't, he seemed floppy, he couldn't say anything, didn't react at all. So I was a bit perplexed, but after sort of being surrounded by sort of human conversation, uh, we were talking to him and he was looking out of the window. I had some um, uh, some blueberries which we'd bought on the road uh, in a little plastic cup. And um, he started to eat these blueberries because uh, most of the time he just had a little plate of, of slop. Or uh, a bottle or full a bottle of or something. vegetable juice. And uh, they seemed to have a miraculous effect and suddenly he lightened up and started talking and things like that. Um, I thought it was the blueberries, but in fact, I think it was just being with uh, with normal people. And um, I wanted to take him outside so I could take a picture of him, but it was pouring with rain. So Vika and I had an argument about whether I could take a picture in the in the internet. And then Vanya was looking out of the window and he said, he said, look, 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 it stopped raining. We can go outside. And so we went outside and um, you know, he really perked up even more. And then I understood that with a bit of care and attention, this was a, a normal boy who'd just really been um, consigned to a death sentence. We haven't place. actually described the internet conditions, which were far, far worse than the baby house, where essentially the children were kept naked or half naked on plastic mattresses where they, they weren't given pots to, to pee or defecate into. And they were just lying there 24 hours a day on these plastic mattresses. Uh, when drugs were available, they were given drugs to keep them sedated. And even if they could eat uh, with a spoon, they were given bottles. So just basically left on plastic mattresses to wither away. And then, you know, if, if anybody's put on a mattress and not allowed to walk or move around, muscles atrophy, um, no physical therapy, obviously. They'd been given a diagnosis by the psychiatric hospital number six, the, diagnosis, the very low diagnosis of Banyas, I think, was imbecile, yeah. And that means that all you need is, the word is uhot, which means fed and cleaned, which they were barely fed and barely cleaned, and just left to, to, to die. And their fate was to be buried in the grounds of the internet in however amount of time it took for them to die. So that was, that was, um, mm. that was his fate. To cut a long story short, um, as a result of the publicity, I think partly my article and partly the video which Sergei Kalaskov, the concert pianist turned uh, campaigner, took, um, the children's wing of that internet was closed down. The children were moved back to various internets in Moscow. But uh, Vanya, miraculously, uh, was returned to Baby House 10 just as the director of the, <laughs> had uh, asked Sarah to do. Um, I don't think it was my it doing. Was, um, well, it was a Russian miracle, I think. <laughs> uh, anyway, so he was very pleased to be back. Every, um, uh, he was—he actually had a favourite carer, unlike um, sort of in defiance of all the rules, because mm. he was. Um, and can you can you bring me to what happened in terms of him leaving Russia? How did that happen? It's a very complicated story. You with have lots, to read the book. You have to read the book. To get <laughs> he was out of the internet system. He was still in a baby house. We had to leave because I was posted to the Middle East uh, by my employer. But Sarah managed to find a fostering project who took Vanya in. So um, he was living in a home environment. With a foster mother, the, fost the fostering project was run by Maria Tirnovska. It was called yeah. Our Family. Anyway, in circumstances which you wouldn't believe if you read it in a novel... His plight came to the attention of um, a woman in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It's called Paula Lachutsky. In fact, uh, someone who was adopting 
um, a child from Baby House 10, little girl, wrote, um, saw Sarah and Vanya and wrote a, a little, just a few lines in the parish newsletter of their church. Paula read it and said, um, this boy, I'm going to bring this boy to America. After some difficulties, uh, she achieved that. So um, John is now living in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, an old steel town. Uh, he's graduated from high school and he's now going to college. Alan, I understand that Natalia Vodyanova, the Russian model and philanthropist, has helped you to publicise the book. How did that happen? The book was published in England and uh, my son thought um, we needed a, needed a bit of help with the publicity since the publishers weren't doing very much. And he read an article about Natalia Vodyanova uh, and how she has a, a younger sister with cerebral palsy. Born in the same year as Vanya yep. in, in yes. Nizhny Novgorod. <clears throat> so I sent, uh, at Will's advice, I sent a copy of the uh, of the book to her. Normally you send books to people, they never read them or they take them straight to the charity shop or whatever. She wrote straight back and said, this has moved me immensely. Um, I now understand what would happen to my sister if she'd gone to an institution and I, I'm full of... Uh, admiration for my mother, uh, Natalia's mother, who kept uh, the child, kept uh, Xenia at home, despite all the advice. She said, this, mu this book must be published in Russia. I will make sure it happens, and I will write a foreword for it. Um, uh, there are there's lots of um, false promises in the show business world, but um, it has to be said that Natalia has done exactly what she said she would. Um, she organized for the book to be published in Russian. She's written a wonderful foreword. Uh, which is in English and in Russian. Uh, and she's basically changed the focus of her charity from building uh, play parks uh, for children to give their someone safe to pay to, um, to helping organizations like the Centre of Curative Pedagogics. She um, now goes regularly to the Centre of Curative Pedagogics and, and has, was, has funded a sort of out, what, how would you say it, outpost of them in Tula. You went there, Alan. In Tula, that's right, yes. And also she's found a wonderful woman um, in, uh, in Nizhny Novgorod, her hometown, a similar organisation to Centre of Curative Pedagogy. It's called, Vier it's the Viera Centre, isn't it? Vieras, also yes. founded by, a lot of these organisations are founded by parents of children with disabilities. And the Centre for Curative Pedagogy is in Petersburg? No, it's in Russia, in Moscow, sorry, Moscow, <laughs> yeah, Moscow. And they have they have links now. They're, they're such a strong organisation. They have links to other, to similar similar centres in elsewhere in Russia. And the one in Tula, they took Natalia there, and she's fun. Well, you were there, Alan. She funded what the building, the yes, uh, <clears throat> she funded by well, something called a Likateka. It's a it's a place where uh, parents with children uh, of children with disabilities can come and play and meet meet other parents and generally. And generally um, bring their children on. And have therapy as well, and I have would therapy, think. Yes. Yeah. It has to be said that uh, Natalia, um, she did her own investigation into this issue and she was opening one of her play parks in an internet in Yekaterinburg in the Urals and she asked to go and see um, the severely disabled and um, she met a boy who made a strong impression of her just like eager. Slightly, uh, eager, a slight a slightly older older Vanya and she wrote back to me and said well it's exactly as you described and she spent you know half an hour with him and you know he was um, he was also kept in a cot to, as far as she could tell 24 hours a day and she took him out and she found he had been able to walk but it you know it suited the staff better to keep him in a in bed up 24 hours a day meeting him she's realized the problem still continues to this day but that's great isn't it to have have that backing and from a, 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 yes. a Russian as well <laughs> yes, there should be more Natalia Vadyanovas in Russia well ho let's hope that her influence will make more people go into these closed places and and support the alternatives thank you very much Alan and Sarah Phelps making it more acceptable in Russia to adopt children especially disabled children is then a tricky issue how might this be changed we asked Natalia Vodyanova what she thinks I think it's really important that the families who decide to keep children at home uh, receive the proper support from the government. This is the key, in, in my opinion. This is the only way to solve this solution, to start with helping and supporting those who are brave and who are doing it already, and then integrating these people into society, then slowly other people will see, well, actually, it's not that scary. Other people can do it, yeah. and they're hopefully like that, to reduce the numbers of families who leave the children to institutions and then also increase the number of families who adopt. 
Natalia is careful to point out that though the children who live in homes and orphanages in Russia, like the ones described in Alan Phelps's book, are still treated very badly, this does not mean that the people working in these homes are inherently bad. There is not even one person that Alan kind of pictured as an evil person. There is no one evil. People just... And it's exactly what Russia is. There are no evil people. There are people put in the circumstances where they have to do bad things. The boy behind the book, Vanya, is now called John Lahutsky. John is happily living with his adoptive mother in the United States. I spoke to John, who is now 21, and asked him what he's up to now. I'm at, I'm at a local commu community college here. I'm going to be starting my second semester. Great, and how's it going? It's going wonderful. I'm I made the dean's list. What's that? My first semester. It's a honor roll. Yeah, it's like the dean's list for academic achievement. John is clear on what would have happened to him if he had stayed in a Russian children's home, and he has not forgotten Vika, a Russian woman who helped get him out of there, as well as Alan and Sarah Phillips. I would be dead right now. I would not have much of a future. Uh, I would have died at the asylum if it wasn't for Alan and Sarah and Vika. If it wasn't for them, I, I would be dead. I'm sure of that. That was John Lahutsky, the co-author and subject of the book, The Boy from Baby House 10, which is published by Orion Books. I'm Alice Lanyado for The Voice of Russia. Stay with us. This is The Voice of Russia. The London Bureau of The Voice of Russia is now live on digital radio and online. With news, comment and debate on weekdays between 4 and 7 p.m. Hello, this is Alice Lanyado, reporting for The Voice of Russia in London. The Boy from Baby House 10 is a book about a little boy in Russia who escaped from the nightmare of his life in an orphanage with the help of a British journalist. The little boy was called Vanya. Vanya was eventually adopted by a woman in America where he lives today. The journalist was Alan Phillips of the Daily Telegraph who together with his wife Sarah, a teacher, decided to help Vanya to escape. After Vanya was successfully adopted, Alan wrote The Boy from Baby House 10, which tells Vanya's heartbreaking story. Alan and Sarah Phelps are here in the studio to talk about their long journey with Vanya, from when they first met him in Russia, to how they brought his story to the wider world. Sarah, how did it all begin? Well, we went to Russia because of Alan's work, wasn't it, Alan? Yep, I was the uh, Moscow correspondent for the Daily Telegraph uh, in the 1990s. I was very busy with politics, uh, and there was a war in Chechnya, a very busy time, and um, Sarah was doing something else. Um, well, you could say that I arrived in Russia. I did speak Russian and had taught Russian, but I didn't actually have any idea of the work I could do. I would have liked to have worked in Alan's office, but he, he preferred not to have me in the office. <laughs> so I had to look elsewhere, and quite by chance, I went to a meeting of the Internet going into the baby house again, uh, silence. I eventually found out the reason there's silence is because the children were kept behind very thick, very thick doors, padded doors. So as a visitor, you don't actually hear children's voices when you enter these places. And the children can't move about the baby house freely. They're kept in rooms, which are called grupa, groups. When you go into these places, unusually for a, a, a children's place of residence there's no sound of any there's no sound of any child and is that typical among russian orphanages i would say yes yes even for children's homes internats for older children yes the children are very much kept behind closed doors in groups and wouldn't mix with children from other groups prime minister vladimir putin recently said that he thought foreign adoption should stop and that children's homes should be improved. Alan, how do you view Putin's statement? In fact, I think as long ago as 1997, wasn't it, I think uh, Putin ordered the federal authorities to uh, find ways of keeping children out of state institutions. As far as we can see, not all that much has changed because there are still about 18,000 children in these baby houses. That's for, for the, the under fours. For the, nought, the nought to fours. And that's about the same number 
um, as uh, when Vanya, the hero of uh, of our book, uh, was in Baby House Number Ten back in the 1990s. So not all that much has changed. So there is a recognition amongst some people at the top that the, the system is harmful and something has got to be done. Um, but uh, it's a very long way from someone in the Kremlin or in the Prime Minister's office saying this and uh, the system actually changing because there are a lot of people who have an interest in keeping the system. National Women's Club, probably not somewhere I would normally have gone. Um, I was dragged along by a friend and I met people who were visiting orphanages. Uh, they needed Russian speakers, they didn't have any. So I think the next day I was taken as an interpreter to my first baby house, which is an orphanage for the under fours. And what was that like? Oh, it's very difficult to describe. Very strange world, a very silent world. I remember visiting the, the this was baby house number 10, where I ended up spending a lot of time. The baby house was in quite central Moscow, not far from a very busy shopping street. But most people walking past would not have known it was there. It was behind a high wall and a high gate. When you went through the gate, um, very dilapidated play area, shabby little wooden huts, and not a child in sight.